Okay, let us begin um, the final lecture on standard model theory, also known as quantum field theory two, since the lectures have been unified. And we are in the middle of discussing charge universality and the charge renormalization in the standard model. As we have discussed in QED, that is rather simple by means of one particular Watt identity, which is well known and easy to prove and establish. Whereas in the standard model, we have to disentangle the two phenomena, namely charge universality on the one hand, the physical statement for S matrix elements evaluated on shell, and the simplification on the renormalization constant delta E. Currently, we are working on charge universality, and we have studied the properties of Landau gauge, which is a special gauge where the gauge parameters are zero, where the ghost masses are zero, and where the gauge fixing term does not involve ghost interactions with the Higgs, but only with vector bosons, and the vector boson propagators are transverse, and therefore many loop diagrams actually vanish. In particular, we have found the so-called anti-ghost equation, which tells us that at zero momentum, there are no loop corrections involving ghosts. And as a result of this, we can now go back to the actual proof of charge universality. Namely, we use Landau gauge plus the on-shell renormalization conditions plus the Slavnov-Taylor identity. So, and now we directly start by writing down the appropriate Slavnov-Taylor identity which governs charge universality, which is really the analog of the Watt identity of QED. If you are experienced with Watt and Slavnov-Taylor identities, then you will immediately see the similarity. Namely, we take the Slavnov-Taylor identity and take a third derivative with respect to the photon ghost and with respect to uh, two fields, psi and psi bar, which could correspond to any charged fermion or even to a charged scalar. Doesn't really matter, but we will work for fermions. And then we set the fields to zero. What does it mean? It, uh, the derivative with respect to uh, the ghost corresponds to the gauge transformation in QED direction, so it corresponds to an identity which tells us something related to gauge invariance of QED and the massless photon. And uh, then this is here similar to the water identity of QED between the uh, electron self-energy and the three-point function between electron, electron, and photon. And that was exactly the water identity uh, needed in QED to prove charge universality. And so this is the analog of this. And now we simply need to work out what comes out of this equation in the standard model. And you will see the complexity right now. So what are all the fields, uh, all the terms which actually do not vanish? So as always, we have this structure. Um, products of two gammas and we have one field and one source. So for example, one term that could contribute is this one here, where we have the source of the photon and the photon and then we distribute these three derivatives in an appropriate way, for example in this way. Okay. Then we have here the three-point function between electron, electron, photon and a prefactor, and that prefactor corresponds to the gauge transformation of the photon, which uh, is the derivative of the ghost, and from this we will get a factor p mu, momentum p mu. So that will immediately give us the contraction of the momentum p mu times the three-point function, which was the essence of uh, one of the terms in the QED water identity. Very nice, but it goes on. 
So then uh, the photon mixes with the Z, it has the same quantum numbers, therefore whenever there is a photon term, there is automatically also the same term with the Z. And also both of them mix with the Goldstone boson, because even that has the same quantum numbers, so there is also a third term where we have here the Goldstone boson neutral. and then this. And uh, then what else can we have? We can have other uh, contributions, for example, we can have a derivative of gamma here from the Safner-Taylor identity with respect to speed neural fields, psi, and uh, then we have here k psi and then we can distribute those three derivatives as follows. So here we can get the uh, psi bar, and here we get the psi and the ghost CA, plus gamma psi and psi bar reversed psi bar k psi bar gamma psi bar psi. And so we need to be a little bit careful with the signs of um, the expressions. And uh, maybe let me correct that. So like this. And uh, like that. And then we should have always an even number of fermion um, uh, reorderings. Yes. Okay, so this is the Slavnov Taylor identity, and you see this term is exactly equal as in QED, except that the prefactor is not just P mu, but it contains a loop. Um, correction, but somehow it is related to PMU. Here there is the electron self-energy, also electron self-energy, but they are again modified by prefactors which uh, receive loop corrections. And uh, in QED we simply had here PMU uh, at all orders and the prefactors were also fixed at all orders to be equal to the charge. And then in QED we would get PMU times the three-point function gives a difference of two electron self-energies times the charge. And then at p equals zero, this three-point function is equal to the derivative of the electron self-energy. That was simply the QED relation. And now we have all the loop corrections in the prefactors, and we have additional terms from the mixing with the Z and with the unphysical Goldstone boson. And that is the difficulty. And here uh, comes into play Landau gauge, because in Landau gauge we are now able to evaluate all the prefactors, and that is where the simplification comes in. And so let us now do that. So what happens around um, momentum P of the ghost CA approximately zero? So let's see. So the um, this term here was exactly the one that we discussed at the end of the previous lecture, uh, namely that must have been uh, of the order p to the third power. That was the consequence at the end of the last lecture. So we have here a Lorentz index, so clearly it is proportional to p mu, but actually it uh, must not only vanish proportionally to p mu, but to the third power of p. And so therefore the second term is proportional to PCA squared times PCA mu, vanishes with the third power of P. What about the third term? The third term here, um, that is also what we said, the mixing between the Goldstone and the QED ghost is zero at zero momentum because it's zero at three level, and because of the, there are no loop corrections, therefore it remains zero at all orders. And so this is a scalar, so if it's zero, then it uh, behaves as p square at least. So the third term is proportional to at least p c a square. 
Therefore, in the limit uh, where this ghost momentum is small, we can immediately drop those two terms, which are really the specific standard model terms coming from the mixing. So the Z and uh, the Goldstone can now be dropped. And at first order of P, we only need to look at these uh, QED-like terms, namely these three, which are the ones that also appear in QED. And then what is left to be done is the loop corrections. So therefore, let us uh, drop these terms. And then let us do the following, like in QED, we take the derivative with respect to this ghost momentum of the whole expression and evaluate it afterwards at ghost momentum equal to zero. Then that means we take the first order term first order term of p square, uh, of, of this p. So what happens in this way? Then uh, we get here the following. First of all, that is proportional to p. Therefore, at first order in p, we get only the derivative from here. We do not get the derivative from the second factor, but only the derivative of the first factor, because that is linear in p. And that derivative gives us some constant factor. We don't know which one, but it is a constant. And this constant depends only on this green function, which is universal. There is only one such green function. It doesn't depend on the uh, charged particle in question. Times this interaction at which momentum configuration let's say minus p, p, zero. So the zero here of the photon corresponds to the fact that we have set the ghost momentum to zero. By momentum conservation from here to here to here, this is now the zero momentum. So we get this. Then the second and third term are dropped. And then in the third term, uh, in the uh, last line, what do we get? We get at uh, ghost momentum equals zero, what we said before, so this green function at ghost momentum zero is equal to tree level. That was the point, so this is equal to tree level, and therefore uh, we get simply the tree level result of uh, one of those terms times the first derivative uh, and that is actually p independent, first derivative with respect to the electron momentum now, psi bar psi minus p and p. So here we also use momentum conservation like uh, p prime is equal to p plus p c a, and then uh, let's keep this uh, p prime constant or p is constant. And p, so the derivative with respect to the ghost momentum is equivalent to a derivative with respect to one of the electron momenta. So in one of those terms, the momentum is kept fixed, and then this term vanishes with the derivative, and in the other term, we get exactly this. And then we have exactly a sum of two terms, which is completely analogous to the structure in QED. Constant times three-point function evaluated at this momentum configuration is equal to another constant, which is governed from tree level times that. And so, now let us go on. We have not yet used on-shell momenta, but now we can also use on-shell momenta. So we can go to on-shell momenta. So where this momentum here for the electron or whatever fermion self-energy is on-shell, then we know that we have required on-shell renormalization conditions for this. So therefore, if we evaluate everything between spinors u of p uh, u bar of p and u of p, then uh, because of the on-shell renormalization condition, this again becomes equal to tree level. All the on-shell conditions basically mean that these two-point functions behave as at tree level um, at on-shell momentum. So therefore, this becomes also equal to the tree level result. And therefore, uh, at um, 
evaluated between Spino, U bar and U, and evaluated for on-shell momenta and zero photon and ghost momenta, we get uh, uh, the final relationship which I write down here, namely U bar of P times the three-point function gamma psi bar psi a mu at momentum minus p, p zero, u of p. This relationship is equal to some non-vanishing constant times um, the tree-level result. So this is the relationship. So this object here is equal, so I should say on shell. Because basically this factor is now three level, this factor is equal to three level, this is the constant and therefore we can solve this is equal to its three level value. Right? So there are no loop corrections. And that applies for the fermion psi that we have chosen, but we have not chosen a specific fermion. The derivation works equally for all fermions, and therefore this is true for all charged particles or charged fields psi. And that means that our relationship that we wanted to prove and that I outlined in the morning is really true, namely uh, the effective on-shell interaction of any charged particle with the photon is equal to some universal constant which doesn't depend on the matter field times whatever you prescribe it to be at lowest order. And what do you prescribe it to be at lowest order? It's the electron charge times Q, where Q is this quantum number T3 plus hypercharge. That is the claim. So once you fix those quantum numbers, by writing them into the Lagrangian, then for these on-shell values, there are no loop corrections at all. And simultaneously, this is the case for all charged particles. Therefore, uh, if you now satisfy an on-shell renormalization condition, where the condition would tell you that this, uh, for the electron specifically, by definition, is equal to the electron charge times the tree-level result, then you know from this simultaneously the same is true for all other charged particles. They all will be equal to the electron charge times their respective tree-level results. And so this is the universality of the electric charge, which is this important property of QED, and we see here that it holds in the same way also in the standard model. But because of the non-abelian nature and because of the mixing, it is much more complicated. So the non-abelian nature comes into play in the loop corrections, which in principle are there in those prefactors, but they are absent in Landau gauge. And the mixing comes into play here, uh, which we can also control in Landau gauge. All right, so this is this important physical statement. Let me clean the blackboard and remove this uh, French language stuff. Right. Then we can go to the second topic, which was applying this uh, to simplify the renormalization constant for the electric charge. So that is then charge renormalization. And here again, surprisingly, there is quite some literature on this. And you can find this in exactly the references that I have already mentioned uh, many times. And let me present you the latest progress on this, which is probably the ultimate simplification of charge renormalization, the most beautiful, uh, let's say, approach, which in the simplest possible way gives you the most powerful possible answer. Uh, so that was really uh, ingenious progress by Dittmeyer, I would say. How do I write this? In 
ingenious uh, idea or trick by Dittmeyer. And as you see, sometimes, though not always, uh, the simplest ideas are sometimes the best, even though it doesn't always work like this. But in this case, the idea is to use a test particle, you know, from high school or from first semester classical mechanics, where you have all these test particles in the gravitational field of the Earth, so not to disturb anything or test particles in electric fields and so on, so with very small mass, very small charges and so on. And surprisingly, you can use the idea of test particles also in renormalization theory. And so here we introduce a test particle into the standard model which almost doesn't change it, um, which is an infinitesimal addition to the standard model, which is only there to, uh, let's say, give us some information on the renormalization structure. And by this trick, we can, in an extremely simple way, get the information that uh, many people before, including the same uh, people, have struggled with. So let's say this is uh, the idea of a test particle. He calls it differently, but anyway. So the idea is to introduce a new fermion. Uh, let's call it eta, which has the following properties. It is a Dirac fermion. Dirac fermion means that it has equal left and right-handed uh, charges. Therefore, we do not have to distinguish left and right-handed parts of it in the Lagrangian and in the interactions. And most importantly, it does not give a contribution to the gauge anomaly. Because only chiral fermions can contribute to gauge anomalies. Therefore, uh, the structure of the standard model cannot change in a significant way by adding such a Dirac fermion. Then, it is an SU2 singlet. Just to make it simpler, such that the generators TA are zero, and it has, a, let's say, hypercharge equal to electric charge uh, Q eta. For a singlet, hypercharge and electric charge are equal. And so let's call this charge Q eta, and let's treat this as infinitesimal. That is the idea. And uh, then there are no interactions with anything. Except what? And maybe this is a small exercise for you. So if you add such a fermion to the standard model, what could be the possible gauge invariant terms in the Lagrangian? And what are the possible resulting interactions of such a um, particle and field with all other particles which exist? So, so I will add here one line which interactions exist, and so you might uh, say that the standard model Lagrangian uh, gets the following additional terms. So what are the additional terms, or what are the possible interactions? So who has some ideas? Some idea. Mm -hmm. So kinetic term would need um, covariant derivative. And so we would have this uh, eta. It is called I d slash eta. And the covariant derivative would be the one that it always is. And in this case, there are no TAs. Uh, there is only hypercharge. And therefore, indeed, it interacts with the Z boson and the photon, but not um, with the W boson. And there is a mass term, minus m eta times eta bar eta. And that is gauge invariant because it is a Dirac fermion. So uh, left and right handed eta transform in the same way. Therefore, we can write down an explicit mass term for it. Question, can we also write down an additional mass term coming from the Higgs interaction, like a Yukawa term? 
where also the Higgs gives a mass to this eta particle. Exactly. So first, yes, right. It's exactly as you say. So in particular, the hypercharge can never be uh, conserved since no other particle has such a hypercharge which could um, add up with this to zero. Therefore, that's all. And uh, therefore, the only interactions are photon and Z. Okay, but uh, the standard model has charge universality. And charge universality clearly is not destroyed by adding such a fermion because the proof, of course, does not know how many fermions there are in the standard model and whether they are Dirac fermions or non-Dirac fermions. The proof doesn't care about the nature of the fermions. Therefore, of course, it applies also to the eta. The eta is one of the fermions that we can use over there. charge universality. So the on-shell condition for psi, for all psi, is equivalent to an on-shell condition for Eta. That means we can now say that uh, instead of applying and imposing an on-shell renormalization condition for the electron-photon interaction and computing our renormalization constant, we say instead of it, we impose the same on-shell condition for eta and then evaluate our charge renormalization constant and then we know that uh, it is the correct result also for the other on-shell conditions. And because of this infinitesimal charge, and because of these extremely simple interactions, computing the renormalization constant from the eta condition will be extremely simple. So what we need to do is to work out the renormalization procedure. So let us now really take the on-shell renormalization condition for the case of the eta fermion. And the on-shell condition for the eta fermion means that uh, for eta being on-shell and the photon having zero momentum, uh, all the loop corrections, including counter terms, must add up to zero. That is, in words, what must happen. And in order to do that, we, of course, now have to evaluate the one particle irreducible um, higher order corrections to that green function. So we need to write down what all these Feynman diagrams are. Which Feynman diagrams exist for this interaction? We can start with tree level. Tree level exists. And we know its value because it's unambiguously given by the charge. But how does it go on? There is, of course, counterterm contribution. So this is a one particle irreducible contribution to this green function. And this renormalization constant um, contains delta E, among other things. And delta E is the thing that we want to determine. What else? In addition to this, we get actual loop diagrams. What are the actual loop diagrams? <coughs> 
Yes. This Feynman diagram is proportional to Q eta to the third power. Because each vertex contains Q eta. And this Feynman diagram is Q eta to the first power. Now, if Q eta is infinitesimal, then this diagram is in some sense negligible. We might need to become a little bit precise what that means, but uh, for that reason, you might wonder, are there maybe Feynman diagrams with fewer powers than Q eta to the third power? So clearly there are Feynman diagrams with higher powers. So that, for example, would be Q eta to the fifth power, and so on. Um, or such a Feynman diagram. Here it depends if this loop could be, for example, a top quark. Then this Feynman diagram contains three powers of Q eta and two powers of the top quark charge, which is not infinitesimal, uh, three. But does anybody see diagrams which involve less than three powers of Q eta? I would say that at least I can see some diagrams with two powers of Q eta. Can anybody see a diagram with two powers of Q eta? It is a good practice for you to think in terms of standard model Feynman rules, what kind of interactions exist. So you might, for example, start your line of thought from this diagram here. So this diagram contains three powers of Q eta and two powers of the top quark charge. Yeah, okay, good idea. So let's try that. Actually, so it would, should look like this. And then here there must be a photon or a Z. So then we must connect this somehow. There is not a triple vertex where one photon goes into two other photons, but clearly there is, for example, what a W boson loop, for example. W boson loop, and then this could be here a Z and photon, photon, something like that. Indeed, very good. Q eta square. But I think it is quite obvious without going into any further details that there are absolutely no diagrams which are linear in Q eta. There cannot be any loop diagram where we have only one coupling to the eta line. The eta line must go through the diagram and so if it's one pi then the eta line must have for sure at least two couplings and therefore every diagram except for those two must be at least uh, order Q eta square. So we can say it is equal to this plus that plus order at least Q eta square. Very good. And so, okay, uh, not, maybe not immediately very good. So what is actually the result of this? Let's write it down. 
This is minus I E Q eta times gamma mu. And the counter term Feynman rule, I copy it from here, is minus I E Q eta times delta E over E plus one half delta Z A A and um, plus the field renormalization constant delta Z eta for the eta field. And then um, there is this other term for the counter term coming from the mixing with the Z boson minus I E divided by sine times cosine times minus Q eta sine square uh, times gamma mu here in all these cases, gamma mu times sorry, delta Z, Z A divided by two plus higher orders in Q eta, Q eta square. Okay. So this is the expansion. And now we can be precise. So we know uh, for sure that at order Q eta we have this expression and then there are some additional terms which are all of the order Q eta square or higher order in this term Q eta. And I'm not even excluding that also these renormalization constants depend on Q eta. Maybe they do, then uh, part of this would also contribute to higher orders. But that is okay, so but this is a correct expansion. Then uh, what we want is the delta E determination. And uh, so delta E will now uh, depend such that the whole sum of all the diagrams, including loops and including renormalization constants, have to vanish for the on-shell configuration. So one small thing is the delta Z eta. So delta Z eta is determined from the self-energy, which are such Feynman diagrams. This is the self-energy um, diagram for the eta particle. And so this is, of course, also uh, Q eta square. And so clearly, there are higher order diagrams like this, which are Q eta to the fourth. There are also diagrams which are only Q eta, maybe with some W boson loop in the photon propagator as well. But again, here it is also obvious that since there must be an eta line in the Feynman diagram, it is clear that the diagram contains at least two powers of Q eta. So therefore, uh, delta Z is determined from the derivative of this on shell. Delta Z eta is of the order Q eta square. Okay, and therefore we can now evaluate uh, the whole idea, namely the on-shell condition tells us the following, zero is equal to uh, this expression here above at on-shell momentum. which is Q eta times uh, this delta E over E plus one half delta Z A A plus, well then uh, here, what do you say? Uh, this is minus sine divided by cosine times delta Z Z A divided by two, so I can combine the delta Z Z A term with this and I get this additional prefactor, sine over cosine of the weak mixing angle and all of this gets corrections plus order Q eta square. And so the delta Z eta has dropped out of the square brackets and all the loop diagrams have also dropped out of the square bracket. So what we get uh, in simple terms is that our on-shell condition is valid for every value of Q eta. 
but uh, therefore it's in particular valid at first order in Q eta. And at first order in Q eta, we only get a relationship between delta E and the field renormalization constants for the photon and the Z. And all the actual loop diagrams that contribute to the self-energy and all the actual vertex corrections which contribute to the process, they completely drop out because they are of higher orders in this Q eta. And so this is this uh, metric of the test particle trick. And so we completely decouple the non-trivial loop graphs from the simple formula which relates our delta E over E with uh, field renormalization constants. And so therefore, for infinitesimal Q eta, where we recover the actual standard model without the test particle, we get that this square bracket here must vanish. And uh, this is then the condition which gives us the value of delta E over E. So let's write this down. It must be valid for all values of Q eta and for Q eta equals zero, we recover the actual standard model. And therefore, oops, in the standard model, we have the following result, namely delta E over E plus one half delta Z AA minus sine divided by two cosine delta Z Z A equal zero. And that is really the simple result, which is analogous to QED, and which uh, corresponds to this more complicated word identity discussion that we had the last time. Um, however, the word identity was derived at one loop level, and I didn't even show you the derivation, but it is coming on the one hand either from complicated discussions or from explicit one loop calculation. But this discussion here is automatically valid at all orders, and it is anyway much simpler. Um, the resulting form, this exact form is not valid at all orders because I did this expansion where the renormalization constants are expanded in first order of the deltas. At higher orders, there will be products of deltas on the left hand side. But anyway, it's trivial to extend this uh, to all orders. So let me write this holds um, with suitably generalized at all orders. And that was actually a formula which was searched for for quite some time. People have de um, derived the two-loop counterpart of this expression uh, when they needed certain two-loop calculations in the electroweak standard model. And those derivations were convoluted and also not really convincing to everybody. But here, uh, with this very simple way, one has found an all order expression. And uh, now one is sure that also I mean, the two loop uh, formulas were correct. But um, now we have a very simple, elegant, and also powerful derivation. And maybe one can use this idea and the method with this test particle also in other contexts. So it's nice to see that one can do this also in order to study renormalization. Good. This ends our discussion of the on-shell renormalization of the standard model and its interpretation. And now in the last part of the lecture, I would just give you a few minutes of um, overview of how these loop corrections can be applied in practice and what kind of important loop corrections there actually are, because there are quite some interesting loop effects which play an important role in phenomenology of the electronic standard model. Do you have first some questions? Questions or comments? No. Okay. Let me clean and then let's go on. Now, Let's go to explicit loop calculations. And I want to, and we obviously cannot in one hour uh, do a lot of different loop calculations, but what I want to focus on are the actual parameters and corrections to them.
And this will then, in a way, close the circle to our very first lecture on the Electroweak standard model where we started with simple um, processes and um, simple parameters like weak mixing angles defined in the Z interaction, in the W interaction, and so on. And uh, then you get some overview and insight what can happen in general. So uh, let's start with the inputs. So the nice thing about the on-shell renormalization scheme is that it directly gives you an operational definition of all the input parameters. So what are the input parameters? The electron charge, the masses MW, MZ, M Higgs, and then also the fermion masses like the top quark mass and so on. Namely, E is defined as the effective measurable charge measured in low energy interactions with on-shell particles. Effective charge for low energy, which is the so-called Thomson scattering. And the masses, M, W, Z, Higgs, and M top, and so on, they are defined via the poles of the propagators. Um, there is this uh, subtlety which I mentioned regarding the real and imaginary parts uh, that was in section 3, 2, 5, such that you do not forget about this. So we were not completely precise in um, deciding how to treat this subtlety, but there are different ways how to treat it, and one in practice, if you want to be precise, have to decide for one of them and then know the difference. But anyway, uh, if we are at the pole of the propagator, it means that if you look at a process like this, we are in an intermediate state, there is a particle with uh, all loop corrections applied, then uh, the process and the amplitude behaves like 1 over p square minus um, m square plus i m gamma, where gamma is the width of the particle, m is the effective mass which is measured, and uh, the whole combination is this complex pole um, in the complex p square plane because as we said, in general, the pole is not on the real axis, but for unstable particles, the pole is in the complex plane and uh, in the negative, with negative imaginary part. And, uh, but anyway, if you convert this into a probability by squaring such an amplitude, then you simply get a bright Wigner peak. And uh, the center of the bright Wigner peak is as a function of p square at m square, and the width of the peak is basically given by this gamma here. So, and then of course, you have a way experimentally to determine, um, or let's say maybe square root of p square, then you have an experimental way, and uh, as I said, an operational definition of how to measure the masses and also of how to measure the width of the particles. And that is then converted into the on-shell input parameters. And so let me just for fun give you the numerical values. So alpha e square over 4 pi defined in this way is of course 1 divided by 137 with many, many known digits which I will not write down. Then uh, the other masses, mz, is 91.1876 with an uncertainty of 21 in the last two digits, GeV. So that means the uncertainty is 2 MeV compared to 90 GeV. So this is an uncertainty of um, much less than 1 per mil. It's a 10 to the minus 4 uncertainty, less than 10 to the minus 4. W mass, 80.377, uh, 12 
GeV, where I took this value yesterday from the particle data group. But as you may know, uh, CTF result is different. So that is the particle data group which compiles regularly the most up-to-date measurements and uh, combines the uncertainties. But they didn't take into account that CTF result, even though that is published and that differs from this by many standard deviations. So this is one of the problems particle physics is facing right now. But you also see, uh, ignoring that discrepancy, here you also have 12 MEV, uh, MEV uncertainty, which is also much better than one per million. Very high precision, but much less precise than for the set. So the set has one digit more. So the set is approximately five to 10 times more um, precisely known than the W. And the Higgs, 125.25 with an uncertainty of 17 in the last two digits. So this is also um, one per mil. One per mil accuracy. And the top quark, 172.69, with an uncertainty quoted of 30. GEV also from the particle data group and uh, here the quoted uncertainty is um, a few percent, uh, sorry, few per mil. And so on. But these are the most important parameters for the electroweak physics at the electroweak scale, where, for example, the electron mass is negligible. And then there are quantities like the weak mixing angle, cosine W, CW, which is in the on shell scheme an abbreviation for MW divided by MC. And we have already given the numerical value of that in the first lecture. OK, and so you see that actually the input parameters are very precisely defined and very precisely known. Therefore, in the on-shell scheme, we are in a very good position. Our input parameters are basically all known at the per mil level or better. And so that is the starting point for all kinds of calculations. And so we can predict, in principle, many, many observables with very high precision and therefore test the electroweak standard model very accurately. Now let us discuss the impact of renormalization and uh, sketch then how it comes into play in actual calculations of observables. And we will start with the so-called shift of the fine structure constant. The fine structure constant alpha undergoes effectively a shift delta alpha, which is numerically very large and an important effect in many loop calculations in standard model calculations. Let's see where this comes about. So the on-shell renormalization constant delta E is of course a building block which will enter many calculations because whenever we do loop calculations, we need counter terms and this counter term will practically everywhere appear. And we have now derived delta E over E is equal to minus one half delta ZAA minus sine divided by two cosine delta Z, ZA. So uh, this basically then did is determined by the photon self-energy and the mixing. So here, photon self-energy. And here, fermions can run in the loop, like in QED, of course, and for electron and so on, it would be the identical Feynman diagram as in QED. But also other charged particles, like the W boson, can also run in the loop. So here, for this delta ZZA, there are actually only non-abelian contributions appearing. Because if the standard model were abelian, then you could prove by using the QED word identity that this must be zero. 
Therefore, the only non-zero diagrams must somehow know about the non-abelian gauge structure, and those would be diagrams, for example, with W boson loops. So W plus minus, and then you would have here a non-zero Feynman diagram between photon and Z at zero momentum. And uh, also ghosts could also appear here in the loop. Okay. So then in principle you have to calculate all these loop diagrams, maybe not even only at one loop order, but at all loop orders in order to get a precise handle on this delta E. Of course there are also ultraviolet divergencies in those loops, but in particular there are important finite contributions. And now we focus on one class of finite contributions which uh, enter into delta E over E, which give rise to this numerical shift of the fine structure constant. Namely, a certain class of Feynman diagrams actually have a singularity, a singularity which makes them particularly large concerning their finite amounts. And these are Feynman diagrams with light fermions. So let us introduce here QED like notation. So in the standard model we had the notation sigma AA transverse of Q, let's say for a fermion F. And in QED we had the notation pi gamma. And uh, so the relationship is uh, that this sigma AA transverse is the same as Q squared times pi gamma in QED. And for the light fermions at one loop, they behave like in QED, so it makes sense to replace this by the QED building block. So then this contribution of the light fermions at one loop level to this transverse self-energy goes like the QED photon vacuum polarization pi gamma QED with a fermion F, which is a function of Q square. So that is clearly the same. And then we can go to our QED lecture from last semester and copy the results, pi gamma of QED for a fermion F at momentum Q square. So that was quantum field theory 1b, the w one of the last lectures. Fine structure constant alpha divided by 3 pi times the charge QF square times the following, the divergent term capital delta plus the logarithm of mu square divided by the fermion mass square plus q square over 5 mf square plus higher orders where the higher orders are in q square. So this is an expansion for small momenta. For zero momentum we have just this and for small momenta we have this uh, linear term in Q square and then there would be higher order terms in Q square as well. So the point is that this is singular if the light fermion masses go to zero. If a light fermion or any fermion has zero mass then we get here a logarithm of zero which is infinite and if the fermion masses are not zero but small then we get here a logarithmic enhancement coming from the small light fermion masses. Therefore, we get here a large contribution, and it is larger uh, the larger the light, uh, the smaller the light fermion masses are. And this is an important effect. So let's write this down. This is singular for MF going to zero. It is a so-called mass singularity. And actually, if you look around and uh, look at all loop diagrams which typically ap appear in Feynman diagrams, then this is the only such singularity for most calculations anyway. If it is the only such singularity, then it means there is precisely this um, location in our calculation where logarithms of light fermion masses will appear. Those logarithms will be large 
and uh, therefore we can control the large light fermion locks by just focusing on this contribution here. And then we know for most calculations where this statement applies, there are no other singularities in the fermion masses, then we immediately can, um, um, let's say, take into account the large locks from light fermions by only looking at the contribution coming here via the renormalization constant delta E. And for this reason, one defines now a shift in the fine structure constant, which is the following. Delta alpha, a shift in alpha, is defined as follows. Namely, we take just a logarithmic term, basically, pi gamma coming from light fermions um, in QED or in the standard model AA uh, at zero minus pi gamma from the light fermions AA at a different momentum, namely at mz square. You could do it also for other momenta, but uh, typically one chooses the Zma square. In general, one could also have delta alpha at Q square, and then you put over there some Q square argument. Okay, but uh, that is the most common thing. And if you do that difference, the difference means uh, that the divergent delta drops out in the difference, so this delta alpha quantity is finite and the large logarithms, they remain. So, and uh, we didn't evaluate exactly that, but uh, let me give you the result. The result of the difference is alpha over three pi times the sum over the light fermions, and for each light fermion you get qf square, qf square times ln mz square divided by the light fermion mass square minus 5 over 3, some constant additional term also. And uh, so the logarithm, um, so the logarithm of the unphysical scale mu also drops out in the difference, and so you get here a physical large logarithm between the set mass and all the light fermion masses. And so in particular, the electron will give a large contribution here because it's 10 to the minus 4 times smaller than the set mass. And so this is a large contribution. So and, um, okay, so let me say it actually here. So this delta alpha gets uh, the following numerical value. Uh, you can split it into delta alpha from leptons plus delta alpha from hadrons. And uh, this is around 3% plus 3%. So both shifts from both delta alphas are around 3%, and so in total, this delta alpha shift is 6%. So it's a quite a large shift, and if you uh, remember that all the quantities are measured to 10 to the minus 4, then 6% is an incredibly large dramatic effect, which of course must be controlled and taken into account in calculations. So now the question is, how does this actually appear in uh, calculations? where um, you do not just calculate delta E, but you calculate an observable, an observable quantity. Where does this come into play? It comes into play in the following way. Typically, calculations of uh, physical quantities will uh, be proportional to some power of the charge, for example, E square at lowest order. Then, uh, at higher orders, when you do loop calculations and renormalization, the E square will be replaced by E square plus two times delta E over E because of the renormalization transformation. And so then, uh, including higher orders, your calculation will involve a factor E square over four pi times this correction here. And uh, this correction is now delta alpha. So this um, is equal to alpha times 1 plus um, essentially this pi gamma, pi AA at 0, because delta, uh, this delta E over E 
is uh, to a good approximation for the light fermions, we can ignore this delta ZZA because that doesn't contain fermions, only this contains fermions. This comes from uh, the QED pi gamma. So that is what we have, and this uh, pi gamma AA gives exactly the two times delta E over E. And now we can replace this by alpha times one plus Pi AA contains divergences and it contains the large logs and it contains the unphysical scale mu square. So this can be written as follows. It can be written as delta alpha plus a rest, namely pi AA rest, let's say, at zero minus pi of the light fermions AA at mz square. Okay. So I have simply uh, extracted pi AA, I write it as pi AA from the light fermions plus pi AA from the rest, and then I add and subtract the light fermions at mz square. And in this way I have artificially introduced the quantity delta alpha. And here is the remainder. So there is additional diagrams at zero momentum, and we need to again subtract um, this pi here. Uh, plus, then the sign is correct. Okay, so now why that split? This delta alpha is now finite. It doesn't contain ultraviolet divergences, and it doesn't contain the unphysical renormalization scale mu. However, it contains physical large logarithms of the light fermion masses, with which is an important effect. Those remaining quantities at zero momentum do not contain singularity, so they are small. And those additional Feynman diagrams, uh, or the light fermions at the z mass scale, they also do not contain singularities because there is the z mass scale which prevents such a low mass singularity. So this is regular for light fermions going to zero. This is regular for light fermions going to zero. Therefore, we can simply say this is not singular. And therefore, it is not enhanced. And so we can simply say at this point, it is small. It is small because it is not enhanced by the light fermion masses. And what it is exactly, uh, we don't know at this point, but uh, it is something which uh, does not have this interesting enhancement from the looks. Therefore, we can say, In an actual calculation, which at three level contains the fine structure constant alpha, what will happen at higher orders is that inevitably this alpha will be replaced by alpha times one plus delta alpha plus small corrections. And this delta alpha is the single source of singular logarithms of the light fermions. So, renormalization amounts to this replacement delta alpha summarizes the singular ln m fermion terms So therefore, you can now see that in essentially all electroweak loop calculations, this will appear. And the discussion that you might have and that you should wonder about, maybe offline or now, is why does this not play an important role also in QED, where we didn't discuss it like this? Uh, why is it particularly important in the standard model? And that has in, in one way to do with uh, my statement that in most calculations, this is the only source of such a mass singularity. 
maybe in some calculations that is not true and then of course this replacement doesn't make sense and it will not give an important or relevant contribution to the final result. Only in those calculations where indeed uh, this is the only singularity for light fermion masses, this is a uh, quantity which is worthwhile isolating. And the point is that the electroweak calculations typically happen at a physical energy scale around the Z mass or W mass, which is a very high energy scale, much higher than the light fermion masses. And because of that, these logarithms are very large. And in QED, you typically consider processes which do not happen at very high scales, but maybe at the electron mass scale, and then the log of the energy divided by the electron mass is not enhanced, and there is no way, physically speaking, to assume that the electron mass is infinitesimally small compared to the energy scale of relevance for your process, because you're looking at electron scattering at electron uh, energies. So therefore, only at electroweak physics, where the energy scale set by the electroweak bosons is very high, this is a relevant effect. And if you look at other physics situations, maybe at intermediate energies or at even higher energies than electroweak ones, then this discussion should be modified appropriately. But for processes which really happen at the electroweak scale, this is typically a very important and, uh, effect and a useful thing to think about. And so in the on-shell renormalization scheme, that fine structure shift uh, enters via the renormalization constant of the electric charge. And as some of you might know, there are renormalization group techniques and the MS bar renormalization scheme, where one can also define a running coupling constant. And then essentially the same effect is taken into account by the running of the coupling constant, uh, which then runs to high energy scale and resums those large logarithms. But this is not the same mechanism, but it is related and gives rise to the same kind of logarithms, but in a different technical way. Yep. Um, typically to the highest energy scale of relevance for your process. So, yes, so in case we do scattering of W bosons, then this would be the energy scale if we calculate decay of the Z or decay of the Higgs boson, then that would set the energy scale up to which we integrate the renormalization group equations. In the context of, yeah, okay, other question? The small um, remainder, does it now contain the UV divergencies? Yes. Okay. Yes, and they, of course, cancel against other stuff in the full calculation. Clearly, we know that the ultraviolet divergencies cancel, and so they are neither large nor small. They cancel anyway, and we are caring here about the additional finite pieces which enter the renormalization constants. And this is an important uh, large finite piece. Maybe, I mean, the logic of what I'm doing here is I want to make you aware, most of all, that these quantities and these parameter shifts exist. And whether they are important for your calculation that you do in your daily life, you have to figure out yourself. But typically, I am saying these quantities are important, and that is why I want you to know about them, and uh, their interpretation, and their sizes, and their origins. There is one second quantity that I want to discuss in the same way, and then we come to the muon decay as an example. And the second quantity is the row parameter. So let me remind you of this miracle in the standard model. One of the many miracles was the so-called row parameter, which is equal to one. The so-called three-level row parameter, which was defined to be mw square 
divided by mz square times the weak mixing angle cosine square. And this at three level is exactly equal to one. That was a miracle in the sense that it relied on this custodial symmetry, a hidden symmetry which was not part of the invention of the standard model, but which nevertheless exists in it and which guarantees that uh, the mass matrix contains uh, three equal entries instead of two, which would be the general consequence of SU2 cross U1 broken down to SU2 U1. So the three level row parameter in the standard model is one because we break the SU2 cross U1 symmetry by a Higgs doublet instead of something more complicated like a Higgs triplet. And uh, experimentally, uh, this ratio also is approximately one, but it is not exactly equal to one. And we already saw that the um, custodial symmetry which backs this up is actually violated. It is not an exact symmetry of the standard model, but it is violated by higher order corrections coming from the top quark. And so this relationship will be modified by loop corrections. And the shift in the row parameter called delta rho is coming from these important loop corrections which break custodial symmetry and which give rise to differences here which are actually observable and which are ob observed. So this is a second very important such parameter shift which again enters many calculations in a kind of universal way. So in the on-shell scheme, let's first of all remind ourselves that there is no variable for the weak mixing angle. So in the on-shell scheme, uh, there is only the variable CW and SW, which by definition is exactly equal to the mass ratio. So in the on-shell scheme, we cannot really speak of corrections to this equation. It doesn't make sense. So this is exactly true by definition. But there is an important uh, renormalization constant Namely, an interesting renormalization constant would now be delta of the weak mixing angle square, delta CW square. This will for sure appear in calculations, but as I already told you, this is to be regarded as an abbreviation for the renormalization of that. But anyway, uh, even in this way, this renormalization constant is important and it will appear in calculations. And what is that actually? The, this is evaluated as a differential, so this is delta mw square divided by mw square minus delta mz square divided by mz square. So this is the renormalization of the weak mixing angle. And so, uh, uh, actually, I forgot to divide by cosine square on the left hand side. And delta cosine square is the same as minus delta sine square, so this is also equal to minus delta SW square divided by cosine W square. Okay, so don't get confused if you're delta sine square divided by cosine square, because the sum delta sine square plus delta cosine square is zero because sine square plus cosine square is always equal to one. So these are important building blocks and uh, for sure they will appear in some um, calculations. Now let us define um, a building block which is delta rho, namely delta rho is defined um, at least at the one loop level as the following sigma zz at zero transverse divided by mz square minus sigma ww transverse at zero divided by mw square. This is the definition of the so-called delta rho parameter 
and it is obviously related to the renormalization constants that you see here because uh, delta mw and delta mz are determined in terms of those self energies only one should calculate them with self energies on shell instead of at zero momentum but you see in this way that delta rho is kind of an approximation to this expression it's an approximation for this expression evaluated at zero momentum so and therefore you can say the following important contributions are as follows. So delta CW square divided by CW square is now the following. So here sigma ZZ is essentially delta MZ square, so this is the negative of this. So this is approximately equal to delta rho plus small corrections. Okay, we don't know for sure that they are small, but let's say it's essentially minus delta rho plus some additional terms. Similarly, delta SW square divided by um, SW square, so the relative uh, correction of the sign, is then given by this, multiplied with uh, the appropriate mixing angles, so that would be plus SW, sorry, CW square divided by SW square times delta rho plus dot dot dot. Okay, so here I get the minus and the product of the two mixing angles in this ratio. So CW square is bigger than SW square. Um, so that is an enhancement here. And what is particularly interesting, delta let's say E divided by SW. Who remembers what is this ratio, E divided by SW? What is its meaning and its role? Where does it come from? From the beginning stages of the standard model theory, where we introduced the weak mixing angle. So that is the, yeah. That is right. So it generally appears in the covariant derivatives uh, once we express them in terms of uh, photon Z and so on. And why does it do that? Because that is actually nothing but the gauge coupling GW. The gauge coupling GW was eliminated in terms of the weak mixing angle and the electron charge, and so that is exactly the GW. And so, of course, in some processes, some Feynman diagrams, effectively uh, GW will appear but we are not allowed to use GW. We must express everything in terms of our fundamental parameters, but nevertheless, this is still an important building block. For example, the W boson interactions go just with GW. So the W interactions will, in the on-shell formalism, always have this ratio here. So therefore, what is the counter term for this ratio? And even diagrams typically contain two powers of the coupling, so let's immediately do it with two powers of the coupling. Then what happens here in this case? So in this case, we get E square times SW square as a prefactor, and then we get a relative correction. The relative correction to this is two times delta E over E, but what is two times delta E over E? 2 times delta E over E is approximately delta alpha. So we get here delta alpha plus some smaller corrections. Then we get minus delta SW square divided by SW square. So we get minus this, minus CW square over SW square times delta rho. And then plus some maybe smaller corrections. So this is how this appears. And so now you see that when you have some process with couplings involving this GW, then inevitably when you do one loop calculations, there will be counter terms and those counter terms will inevitably contain this combination. So there will be a large effect 6% from delta alpha 
you cannot avoid it. And there will be a large effect coming from delta rho. You cannot avoid it. What we don't know is whether the additional terms are maybe even more percent or whether they are small. That depends on the case. But for sure, those corrections exist. And so therefore, now we should focus on this delta rho and explain what it actually is. So the point is that there are large loop corrections to this delta rho. And they are connected to the breaking of custodial symmetry. So should we check, check this? It seems OK. You as well. Large loop corrections from top and bottom. So as I told you, the custodial symmetry were exact if the top and bottom Yukawa couplings were equal, because then we could write the entire Yukawa Lagrangian in terms of this two by two matrix valued Higgs boson field with a universal up down Yukawa coupling. But they are obviously not equal. They are very, very different, and not only different, but one of them is really absolutely large. And therefore, there is a strong breaking. But of course, that breaking affects only one loop corrections and is not present or not visible at three level. And this violates custodial symmetry. And therefore, we get large corrections. And the basically order parameter of this violation is the difference between the two masses. So those corrections will be somehow proportional to the difference of the masses. And let me just give you the result. What you need to calculate is this W boson self energy with a top and bottom loop here mixed. And you also need the Z boson self energy with either top core core bottom loop. And then once you did everything, you can compute the self energies at zero momentum plug it into the relationship, and then you obtain the following. Namely, I think that might just fit here. Delta rho from top bottom is equal to the color factor NC, which is 3, times alpha divided by 16 pi, SW square CW square times the Z mass square times, hmm, uh, maybe it doesn't fit. OK, let me, let me make it fit. Times the following, m top square plus m bottom square minus 2 m top square m bottom square times, times ln m top square divided by m bottom square and divided by the difference m top square minus m bottom square. Can you read this? So this is it. So this is um, not singular if the masses are equal. If the masses are equal, the denominator goes to 0. And the numerator also goes to 0 because we get log of 1. And uh, so the ratio between numerator and denominator goes also to 1. And then for equal masses, that drops out. And we simply have 2 times mass square minus 2 times mass square is uh, 1, uh, is 0. So therefore, at equal masses, that correction vanishes, which corresponds and reflects uh, custodial symmetry. But if the masses are not equal, that obviously does not vanish. And uh, if in the real case where the bottom mass actually is negligible compared to the top mass, uh, let's say just the square bracket, you can write down the whole thing. But the square bracket simply converges to the top mass square.
and then simply you can replace the entire square bracket by m top square. And what you see is that the final result for this delta rho top bottom behaves like alpha times m top square divided by m z square. And that is a large correction because the top mass is very large, larger than the z mass, and therefore we have here also a significant effect which is enhanced. So, and yeah. how large is it actually? So alpha is um, around 1%, as you know. This is bigger than 1%. There are some other prefactors involved and also a color factor of three. So ultimately, this delta rho from the top bottom sector is around 1%. It's a 1% effect which is significant uh, also, again, in the context of these per mil precisions for the input parameters. And if you look at this formula here, then very frequently this combination will appear. And in this combination, the row parameter is enhanced by a factor 3 to 4. So then this would be a 6% and that a minus 3% effect. Two very important effects which we have now isolated and which have two very well-defined origins and which appear universally in many electroweak calculations. Okay, so that ends our discussion of the row parameter and now if we have time, okay, whoever wants to leave or has to leave uh, is obviously allowed to leave and who needs a shine can get a shine. But otherwise I will continue because it would be a pity to stop now uh, without having introduced one of the most important actual loop calculations in the electroweak standard model, namely the muon decay. And uh, in the case of muon decay, we will actually see all these effects come into play. And it is tremendously important for testing the electroweak standard model, both historically but also presently, because there is a controversy associated with the measurements. And so therefore, this is something um, which is worthwhile knowing. And so let me just introduce it a little bit to you. Do you have any other questions? Should we make a break? No. OK. Good. So let us go on and uh, do an example for radiative corrections. U1 decay. And as I said, we close the circle to our very first lecture where we already wrote down the muon decay. So it looks like this. Muon decays into muon neutrino. Um, Anti-electron neutrino and electron. And up to certain well-defined prefactors, the entire amplitude defines the muon decay constant g mu. So when we calculate uh, the muon decay at three level, then the Feynman diagram is this one. We have a W boson in uh, the intermediate state. The f f initial and final states are what I wrote before. And this three level Feynman diagram uh, gives rise to a value of the muon decay constant g mu, which is as follows. We have to read off from the diagram. E square divided by 4 square root of 2 mw square times sw square. Okay. What that means is that you calculate the Feynman diagram and then by definition you apply certain prefactors which are defined also for the experimentalists. So this is a universal definition which I do not have to repeat here. 
but the experimentalists know how to convert their measurement into GMU, and the theorists know how to convert the Feynman diagram into GMU, and then the standard model prediction is this. So this is essentially the coupling constants from the two vertices, and one over MW square from the propagator. And here you see appearing our famous and beloved E square over SW square, which comes from the gauge coupling GW sitting at the two vertices. And the one over MW square comes from the propagator. So remember that the momentum which flows through the line here is totally negligible because it has the energy scale of the muon mass compared to the W mass here, it's negligible. And therefore we just approximate the propagator by one over MW square. So that is the three level result. And the exact result in the on-shell scheme um, is as follows. So we cannot do the calculation, but we have a definition. The exact result is the same formula times one plus delta R, and then delta R by definition summarizes all uh, higher order corrections coming from standard model theory in the on-shell renormalization scheme. So this effectively defines a quantity delta R, which is somehow small. Now, what we want to do is to get a hold on this delta R. So in other words, we want to compute the one loop correction to muon decay in the standard model. And in other words, we want to compute the one loop correction to delta R in terms of an approximation, as good as we can in 20 minutes. And then the way it is used in reality is the theory predicts a certain value of delta R, which is, let's say, still a function of standard model parameters like the top quark mass, bottom quark mass, Higgs boson mass, and so on. Uh, or let's say a percentage, maybe 2%. And then you would know, ah, okay, if I measure the muon lifetime, and I know about these 2%, um, and uh, I know the set boson mass, which goes here, then I can calculate the W mass from inverting the relationship. Or I can test the standard model validity by plugging in all the measured values into all the quantities and uh, check whether it agrees with the calculated value of delta R. Or you say, I know all the quantities like MW, MZ, muon decay, electron charge, and within here I know everything except for the top mass, but the top mass enters delta R, and so therefore I can solve comparing theory and experiment and get a prediction for the top quark mass. Or I can predict the Higgs boson mass because the Higgs mass also enters delta R. So these are all possible ways in which you can use this relationship. It's a standard model prediction for the correlation between observables, and you can solve it for any observable that you want. Currently, it is mainly used for predicting the W boson mass, because uh, this is the crucial quantity which is least precisely measured compared to the, um, let's say, precision that we can achieve in the calculation. Let us do the calculation. One loop in one shell scheme. So what are the Feynman diagrams which appear in a one loop calculation? So there is the following Feynman diagram. This sort of thing, where we have all sorts of one loop diagrams in the W boson propagator. That gives the W self energy. There are all sorts of Feynman diagrams of this kind, where we have a vertex correction in uh, this vertex, similarly in the other vertex. And there are so-called box diagrams, and there are um, counter-term diagrams, let's say, plus this counter-term diagram, this counter-term diagram, 
and this counter term diagram. These are precisely the only three counter terms diagrams which exist for the calculation. But there are, of course, many loop Feynman diagrams which appear. But this is the full structure of the one loop calculation. Um, so just as some examples, uh, or do you need examples? Example. Oh, well, that's why I wrote it as a word, because it uh, becomes a little bit, yeah, I mean, you, of course, you should write it like this, but uh, this seems to me a little bit ambiguous, because we already used that same symbol for the full process. And so, but uh, box diagrams are one particle irreducible diagrams of this structure. Okay, so that's it. Now, one thing that is important for the calculation is that here the momentum Q square uh, in the propagator is much, much smaller than MW square, and so uh, we neglect the momentum and set Q square to zero, such that the W boson propagator just becomes one over MW square. Good. Then, let's evaluate all the diagrams to the approximation that we can manage immediately. So before I delete it, it is clear that our muon decay contains exactly that ratio which I have announced and therefore it will contain exactly that combination. So you can already memorize this. I first wanted to look at uh, the diagram with the W boson self energy and uh, there I would look at the counter term and the self energy simultaneously. So let's call it diagram one plus six the first and the last diagram together. They involve the following combination. Here the loop plus the counter term and uh, both appears inside of the propagator. So for the diagram, we essentially only need uh, the transverse part. Uh, the longitudinal part drops out of the diagram because of uh, the external lines. And then we obtain for the transverse part here minus i divided by minus mw square because we neglect the my q square in the denominator. So we have this simple term from the left. Then in the middle we have minus i times sigma ww at zero momentum. And here we have um, plus i times delta mw um, square minus i times delta z w times mw square times another minus i divided by minus mw square. Okay, so this delta mw square and delta z w that co comes from the renormalization transformation and the counter term. So uh, the mass counter term is obvious, I hope, and the uh, uh, counter term delta z multiplies normally p square minus m square, but p square is zero, therefore here it only multiplies minus m square. So, okay, um, good. Uh, so what is this in total? It is uh, plus i divided by mw square times which correction? So which correction? Um, so this minus i divided by minus mw square times this gives um, plus sigma ww at zero minus delta mw square and the whole thing is divided by mw square. This comes from those two objects. And then we get an additional minus i times plus i plus delta zw times one, and the rest has cancelled. So this is the three-level propagator from the three-level Feynman diagram. And that is a correction. 
So the diagrams one plus six together, they are equal to the three level Feynman diagram times the round bracket. That's exactly the effect. Everything is three level and it is multiplied by this exact bracket. Self energy and the two renormalization constants. Now, what about the diagrams um, with a counter term here at the vertices? Let's call it diagram, what is it, four and five. In the diagrams four and five, what we get is the W boson counter term to two fermions. What is the value of the W boson counter term to two fermions? It is equal to the three level vertex of the W to the same fermions times the renormalization constant. But what is actually the renormalization constant? You always get it in the same sort of way. The coupling gets renormalized and the coupling is here the coupling of delta E over SW, our famous um, combination because that originates from GW. Then divided by the three level term. And, uh, but then we get additionally field renormalization plus one half uh, delta ZW. Actually, question, did I make here a sign mistake? Uh, so in the self energy of the W boson, we definitely get, ah, yes, of course, there is a sign mistake because uh, minus I delta Z is multiplied with P square minus M square. P square is zero, but minus M square. So we have this, and then we have here minus. Okay, good, uh, sorry about this. Anyway, uh, then let's go on. Here plus one half delta Z for the W boson field renormalization and then we have some one half delta Z for uh, the uh, muon and one half delta Z for the neutrino depending on which fermion we are looking at, muon or electron, muon or electron neutrino. All right, therefore, All the diagrams that we have so far looked at, diagram one plus six plus four plus five, they all have a simple feature, namely they are proportional to three level. And between them, the field renormalization of the inner line, the W cancels. That is a typical feature. So look at this, please. So here, the delta ZW enters as follows, we get three level times minus delta ZW. Here we get three level times plus one half delta ZW, and that appears twice, once from here and once from here. So overall, we get three level times minus delta ZW plus two times one half delta ZW, so delta ZW cancels. And that is um, always the case if you have field renormalization for internal lines, it always drops out between the counter terms for the propagator and for the associated vertices. And it just tells you again that field renormalization is unphysical. It doesn't depend how you normalize your fields, the Feynman diagrams, and in particular, its matrix elements do not depend on this. So it has canceled, and what remains is proportional to three level. So therefore, the sum of those four diagrams is equal to the three level diagram times the following correction, namely, sigma WW at zero minus the renormalization constant delta MW square divided by MW square. Then here the counter term that comes also twice, two times delta 
e over sw divided by e over sw, so the relative correction, plus uh, fermion field renormalization. So delta z for the four fermions. Now what happens to those quantities? And what are the dominant terms? So the most important terms in all the Feynman diagrams are the following. So first of all, so far we didn't talk about the box diagrams and those vertex corrections. We ignored them. And uh, that is because we do not know any uh, potentially interesting effect which would make those diagrams particularly large. Therefore, we ignore them. We assume they are small. And in those uh, corrections that we have looked at, diagrams 1, 6, 4, 5, we have this part coming from the self-energy in the counter term. We have this part, which we have already analyzed, and there we get delta alpha and delta rho. And we have the fermion field renormalization. Now, of course, you might have to calculate to check it all, but it's indeed the case that the fermion field renormalization doesn't give large effects, neither enhanced by logarithms, nor enhanced by m top square in the numerator, nor by anything else. Similarly, the box diagrams and vertex corrections, they are not enhanced by anything particular. Therefore, they, they are indeed small. But inside of here, there are two effects which have special enhancement mechanisms. And then what remains is this one here. That is essentially zero because that is given by the on-shell self-energy. So the difference just comes from the momentum dependence of the self-energy, which is also not enhanced by anything. So in other words, the dominant terms are just from delta E over SW, which provides delta alpha and delta rho. And let me just say, sigma WW of zero minus delta MW square is nothing but sigma WW of zero minus sigma WW of MW square, which is uh, assumed to be small. Fermion field renormalization is small. Vertex box diagrams are small. And therefore, everything is small except for our renormalization constant. And so now you see an example of a loop calculation where actually, lo and behold, uh, everything boils down to calculating renormalization constants. So the actual one loop Feynman diagrams for muon decay have dropped out. The only diagrams that you need to calculate are the ones which go into the renormalization constant delta E and delta SW. So it's a neat effect and uh, shows off the importance of renormalization. So overall, the one loop correction to muon decay is given by three level times two times delta E over SW divided by E over SW plus small terms. And since we have conveniently already evaluated this, we get three level times delta alpha minus cosine w square over sine w square times delta rho plus small corrections. And in general, our loop corrections are summarized in the quantity delta r. So now we can bring it into a form for this delta r. What we have done is calculate all the loop corrections, and we interpret now the result in terms of g mu or delta r. And so it's exactly defined in this way, that delta r is the correction factor for tree level. Therefore, this is exactly to be interpreted as our delta r. So in this notation, we get a prediction, a result for delta r, which is delta r is equal to delta alpha 
minus cosine square over sine square times delta rho plus small corrections. And that is the result. And here we get 6% effect. And here we get overall around minus 3% effect. And actually, if you do the calculation, then this amounts to around 1%. So it's not dramatically much smaller, but anyway, it is indeed uh, smaller than the dominant corrections. So that is the result for delta R at the one loop level in the standard model. And you see the two effects. Indeed, mu one decay is affected by the light fermion masses, by these large logarithms from leptons and hadrons. And it is affected by custodial symmetry breaking. And uh, it is affected by some small corrections from vertex box diagrams and everything else. But uh, that is it. And so. Let me just say that uh, this can be used in the following way. So um, historically, it was used, for example, to predict the top mass. Because um, we know that a delta rho contains a term which is proportional to m top square. So it's quadratically depending on m top. Very strong dependence on m top. And uh, of course, before the top discovery, the w mass had been measured. SW depends on the z mass. So mz, mw, e, and the muon lifetime had all been measured. Therefore, you can basically ask for which value of the top mass do I get agreement between theory and the experiment? And then you do a fit. And the outcome was, at the time, top mass between 150 and 200 GeV would fit um, all the results. And then the top was discovered at 170 GeV. So that was really a prime example of um, electroweak loop calculations. And indeed, that led to the Nobel Prize for Toft and Feldman where their main contributions are, of course, in the basis like renormalizability of the standard model, invention of dimensional regularization. But uh, they also did a lot, in particular, Feldman, in uh, inventing the row parameter and uh, putting forward the, these ideas to test the standard model and uh, to do the predictions for such observables. So that was a big thing. And of course, after the top was discovered, one could put in the measured top mass, which is, of course, much more precise than 150 to 200. And then you can do the next step. Namely, then you see that, of course, also the delta rho depends on the Higgs mass. We didn't calculate it, but clearly it depends on the Higgs mass because there are loops involving the Higgs. And then you can do the same question one level higher up. What is the value of the Higgs mass for which you get agreement between theory and experiment? And so one has also predicted the Higgs mass before the Higgs discovery. And uh, that prediction was actually not spot on the observed Higgs mass, but also not far away. It was a little bit lower than, um, than the observed Higgs mass. It was in the ballpark of 60, 80, 90 GeV, something like this, depending on the year one uh, did this analysis. But um, the dependence is rather weak, and therefore one gets basically agreement, again, between observation and prediction. Of course, nowadays, uh, one is again one step uh, further. And we can um, input all quantities, because all the standard model parameters are measured very accurately. And um, in particular, the Higgs mass is also measured to 1 per mil. And then, uh, basically, inside of this delta R, Everything is precisely enough measured. And we can go back and predict the W mass, because the W mass enters at three levels. So its role is amplified. And therefore, we can now use this relationship to predict the W mass. We basically forget that the W mass 
um, is, is known and we predicted from these uh, relations. So the prediction depends on the set mass and the muon lifetime, which is more precisely known than the W mass. And then uh, we get either agreement or disagreement with experiment, depending on which experiment we take. If we take the particle data group value I gave you before, we get perfect agreement. If, however, we get, take the CTF value, we do not get agreement at all, but an eight sigma discrepancy, which is a problem. So, but this is the thing. And uh, let me just end by saying similarly, uh, you can also analyze the structure of uh, contributions to the other observables. of our section 1.1, which were, for example, such observables like set boson interaction with, with all kinds of fermions, where we define these various uh, effective weak mixing angles, for example, sine square theta effective, and so on. And so for all of those, you can now do a similar calculation, and then you will discover again that also for those quantities, the effective weak mixing angle defined in an operational way, you will get corrections from delta alpha, delta rho in a similar form. So this ends our lecture on the electroweak standard model. Um, this is just the beginning, but now I hope uh, maybe some of you might be interested in going further. At least you are now aware of the ingredients and you can follow either the literature or talks and um, summer schools and conferences and so on, or do your own calculations in this business. It is, of course, a very active field um, in the context of LHC experiments where we can do a lot of measurements of relevance like the W mass measurement and uh, similar measurements of um, electroweak quantities where such loop calculations are actually important. Okay, so thank you very much uh, and have nice holidays and see you soon.